what God can do. Amen. Someone's glasses. All right, I'll just leave them here. Don't forget them. Amen. Open up in your Bibles. I just want to take about an hour or two and just close this. Lord, amen. Amen. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Paul gave us these immortal words. These are words that could have been emblazoned on his tombstone. I think any one of us or every one of us should want to have this epitaph or this personal testimony. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Paul said these words, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Powerful words. I want you to get this in your heart and in your spirit that you'll be able to say it with all confidence, with all boldness, not only today, but at the end of your journey. I went, as I shared earlier, just a quick trip down to Atlanta, Georgia. I left Friday night, came back last night to minister at the funeral of a, of a young man, 38 years old. We know him as Sammy. Sam and Erica have four children, 13-year-old um, Giffy and Hezekiah, Elijah and Odell, and uh, also had adopted and, and raised Nelson and Mitchell. Um, and it was so sad, it was so heart-wrenching and heartbreaking to be there uh, to preach at this funeral, there were several hundred people, maybe four or five hundred people, and just a great tribute to this young man, but it's so sad, how do you reconcile or how do you uh, answer the question why? 38 years old, a life seemingly cut short, he was pastoring a church and serving God, very well liked, very just, just so many people appreciated him. He had such a humble heart. You know, and it's just so hard. And, you know, I know people sometimes, even Christians say, you can't question God. Well, I don't know about that. I think God is big enough to handle your questions. I think God's big enough to handle your misunderstandings. Matter of fact, in the Old Testament, there's a prophet called Habakkuk. And the whole premise of, of that book, there's three chapters in the Old Testament, and Habakkuk basically has some questions for God. See, Habakkuk was a prophet, and he declared God's truth, God's righteousness, God's holiness, and, and he had a question because he saw the people of God breaking the commandments, worshiping idols, turning from God, and he, and he says, God, if you're holy and righteous, how come your people are getting away with murder, so to speak. And he said, God, I'm your prophet, I'm your servant, but I don't understand this, God. Why are you allowing this? And God said, okay, good question. I got an answer for you, but I'm not so sure you're going to like the answer. God says, I am going to do something that is going to, you're going to cause you to marvel. He said, I'm going to raise up a, the Babylonians, another nation, to come and judge my people. Now, that caused more confusion, and that caused another question for Habakkuk because he says, God, how can you take a nation more wicked than your people, more ungodly than your people, and use them as an instrument of judgment? And, and God said, listen, thank you for your questions, but I want you to understand something. I'm God. Hello? And the whole premise, basically, of that book is that God is sovereign meaning he's God and we're not, and he does things, and he doesn't necessarily consult with us. And I can't reconcile things, and my heart breaks, and, and I grieve and mourn for life that is cut short or people that die seemingly before their time. But, but see, you have to understand that what the revelation that Habakkuk came to, he came to that very special revelation that was repeated three more times, Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews. And that phrase that he uttered, that revelation he got was, the just shall live 
by faith. That means you have to trust, you have to believe, even when you don't see, even when you don't understand, even when you don't know the answer or the outcome. And he understood that and he got that revelation. So this morning, I want to encourage you. You've got to fight the good fight. You've got to finish the race. For this young man, Sammy, his race is over. But you know what? He finished his race. That was his race to run. That was his time. You have a race to run. Your race is not my race. My race is not your race. But you are called to finish your race. How many of you know it's a lot easier to start something? Come on. I, 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 I've started some projects. They're still not finished. I, I, I moved into a house about four years ago and fixed it all up. It all, you know, good shape, nice. But I still have a hole, a, 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 wall, a hole in the wall that I patched up that, that there's plaster on it. It still has plaster on it. It's still not sanded and it's still not painted. Well, don't let me come and look at your house. <laughs> come on now, you have, a, you have a project in your yard. You started, but you didn't finish. You had something you did with your car, you didn't finish. You have a degree program, you started, but you didn't finish. It isn't easy. It's, it's one thing to start, it's another thing to finish. You know, and you know what the toughest part of any project usually is? Is the middle point. Because the excitement of beginning something has faded. And you're only halfway there and the finish line is too far away. You know, I remember starting my master's program at Gordon Conwell Seminary and, and I remember the first few courses. I was so excited. I was, I was traveling, uh, taking a train into Boston once a week and, and I was so excited taking a take, drive and taking a train class late at night coming back and 11, getting home at 11 o'clock but I was so excited because I'm just starting the program but then when I got to midpoint <sighs> it's not so exciting you know the, the excitement is worn off and now the finish line is just so far away and it's like oh Lord it's a long way I finish I finished the race. Let me tell you, there's going to be things that come in your way to try to hinder you from finishing. You haven't lived long enough if you don't know what I'm talking about. You know, I, I, and then, you know sometimes there's just people that want to hinder you. They want to cut in on you. I worked at a, at a, at a place... Before, when I was one of my first jobs, I was I think it was 16 years old. I I was a dog handler. This was for Lincoln Greyhound Park. And 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 I used to walk the doggies. You know the ones that run around the track that people bet on. Nobody knows about what I'm talking about because you don't go to Twin Rivers. But it used to be the ho the dogs. And I'd walk them, and, and I was called a dog handler, and that was my job. And we'd walk them, put them in the box, and then go collect them at the end of the race, and walk them back, put them in their cage. Well, at the end of the season, when the season was over, they had a, um, for, for the employees, they had a race. Instead of the dogs running on the track, <laughs> they had us running. No, we, no, no betting on me, but I got the program to prove it. They had our names in the, it was, they used to have 12 races. And, and so this was the 13th race. Now, now we would literally get, we're on the track running on the, the, the same sand that the dogs would run on. And, and so we raced and, and, and so this was my first and only time. But what I didn't know next to me was this pleasantly plump individual. This guy that was overweight. And he raced before, and he always came in last. So he decided, I'm not coming in last anymore. And because I was a newbie, I was new in this race, he was right next to me. What I didn't know was that he had a plan. <laughs> he said, I ain't going to finish last. So what he did was, on the way out of the box, or when we began the race, he tried to, like, box me out. Because he didn't want me to beat him. He didn't want to finish last. He said, at least let somebody else finish last. 
So the race starts, and I don't know what's going on, but this, this heavy set gentleman, because he was the slowest, he, he said, I'm not finishing last. He wanted me to finish last, so he boxed me out. He handed me, but the devil is a liar. I still beat him. But you know what? In life, there are people, they, they don't want to finish last, so they want you to finish last. There are some people that cut in on you in life. You know, they're haters. They're the people on Facebook that don't like your post. They like everybody else's post. Wish everybody else happy birthday. Oh, come on. You know some of them people. They cut in on you. They, they want to they wanna get you to, to, to miss out. But you've got to be determined in your life that no matter what other people do to you, I'm going to finish my race. You see, you will get hurt. You will have people cut in on you. You will have people talk about you, lie on you. Look at Paul the Apostle. He said, I finished my race. You think, well, he was Paul. And, you know, a lot of times we read the Bible and, and we read it with rose-colored glasses. I haven't seen you. Where have you been? God bless you. Good to see you. None of you get an idea you're going to miss church for six months and then me give you such a warm greeting. But Paul, you know, we look at the Bible characters and we look at it with rose-colored glasses and, and we, we think that they have halos on and they're not, they're not relatable. But, you know, Paul went through a lot of stuff. And he wrote in, in, in Acts chapter 20, he said this in verses 22 to 24. He says, Behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, except that the Holy Spirit bears witness to me that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me. Neither do I count my life dear unto myself that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry that I received of the Lord Jesus. What was Paul saying? He's saying, I'm going to Jerusalem and there's been a prophecy, uh, not a prophecy of blessing and of, of favor and all good things. He said, you know what? Bonds and afflictions. In other words, they're going to bind me. They're going to put me on trial. They're going to they're beat me. He says, but none of these things move me. Oh, come on. Some of you... Some of you, if somebody sits in your, your seat on Sunday morning, you're moved. And I don't mean physically, but you're all upset. Somebody does something to you, you're, you, but none of these things, Paul says, none of these things move me. Come on, turn to the person next to you, say, none of these things are going to move me. Come on. You say, well, what did Paul go through? Paul, the Bible, he'll write a little further in this chapter, he'll say, at my first defense, in other words, Paul had to go to trial. He was put on trial for his faith before a Roman government. Eventually, Nero, the emperor at that time, would kill, would execute Paul the apostle. Tradition tells us he would have been, had his head chopped off. But he would have a trial. But the Bible says, or Paul says, at my first trial, at my first defense. In other words, Paul walked into a courtroom and, and, and surely he thought, maybe, maybe I'm going to see Onesimus. Maybe I'm going to see John Mark. Maybe I'm going to see one of the, 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 my disciples. Maybe I'm going to see uh, uh, Epaphras or, 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 or Titus or, or somebody. Maybe I'm going to see somebody from Victory Assembly of God. Maybe I'm going to see one of the members. He's looking. I started so many churches. I, I, I disciple people. I led them to Christ. I'm, I'm on trial now. I can't see. Is anybody, somebody, somebody's out there. At my first trial, nobody, nobody stood with me. He says, but the Lord, but the Lord stood with me. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Hallelujah. You see, we have to come to a place 
I know we need people. I know, I know we, we need the comfort, and I'm not diminishing that or denying that, but there's a time when, when friends will forsake you. There's a time when people will walk out on you. There's a time when nobody will be there for you. But if you understand there is a strength, there is a support, there is a pillar, there is an anchor to the soul, and his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Paul said, I finished my race. People caught in on me. People weren't there for me. I was attacked. I was, I was brutalized. But you know what? I finished my race. But you know what he said? He said in, in, in Acts chapter 20, I want to finish my race with joy. Come on. So many, so many sad sack Christians. So many Christians that you, you couldn't tell them from a, from a Christian or a non-Christian. So many Christians, you wonder if they put lemon juice in the baptismal tanks. I'm telling you. So many Christians, they're joyless. Come on, I want to still. I've been pastoring 26 years. It hasn't been easy. I, I've got, I can take my shirt off and show you some sheep bites. A couple of rams <laughs> gored me too. <laughs> but you know what? I want to finish my course with joy. Only, only in God could that happen. Oh, come on. This ain't my first rodeo. This ain't my first time around the barn. I've been through some things. But you know what? The Lord stood with me. Come on. I, I've been married 20, how many years? 26. What did I say? Pastoring 28 years. That's what I got wrong. I know 26 years. We just celebrated last Wednesday, Thursday. <laughs> 26 years, I still want to have joy. Amen. Amen. Finish my course. But turn to the person next to you. I want to finish with joy. Come on, I want to finish with joy. I want to finish with joy. Hallelujah. Come on. And I'm not saying a joy that you can manufacture or get in a bottle or get in a can, but, but the joy of the Lord is my strength. Come on, there's joy. In the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to finish my course with joy. Hallelujah. How many of you are still with me? Hallelujah. I'm talking about a stick to itiveness. You know, Christians need to be like a stamp. Do you know the value of a stamp? The, the value of a stamp is. It's ability to stick to it until it gets to its destination. Christians need to be like that, amen? Need to stick to it until we get to our destination. Hallelujah. It's not a, mar it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And then he says, I kept the faith. And I'm going to finish I'm going to finish with this. I want you to understand something. The faith is used in two different ways in the Bible. He said, I kept the faith. There's the objective faith, which I believe it's, it's, this is the faith. This is the body of truth. This is the doctrine in which we believe in. This is the faith. And then there's the subjective faith or the personal faith. This is my believing in the word. But there's two, two aspects of it. See, you have to understand, we've got to keep the faith in the sense of we've got to be true to the Bible and true to doctrine. And we also have to be faith-filled or faith, living in faith as an individual in the Bible. Let me, let me just try to clarify that a little bit more. Now, if you could put up Jude, if you could help me, if, is there someone, someone there to help me? Jude, the sound man's going to play double, double time, see if he can. Jude, why don't you just turn to it? We get so used to this PowerPoint. Anybody take their Bibles anymore to church? iPhone, iPad, something, amen. Jude, Jude is the last uh, uh, epistle. Oh, there we go. Great job, great job. Jude, look what Jude, beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. What does Jude say? Jude said he, was, he sat down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he wanted to write about their common salvation. He, he was starting out in a certain direction. Then he felt prompted by the Holy Spirit, and he says, you know what? I, I feel impressed 
because I, I feel you need to contend. What does contend mean? Fight. Struggle. Persevere therein. He said, I mean, I, I felt compelled that you would contend earnestly for what? For the faith, the body of truth, the sound doctrine that was once delivered to the saints. Why? Why? Next verse. This is important. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were mocked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness or licentiousness or, or, or promiscuity and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Jude is saying, now you're talking just not even a generation removed from Jesus and the apostles and already false doctrine, false teaching, lies had infiltrated the church and Jude feels compelled. He says, I need to tell you, you've got you've to hold on to this, the truth with both hands. He says, because there are people that are coming in and they're going to try to pull you in this way, in that way, in, in the other way. They're going to try to get you to believe things that are not biblical, that are not according to the faith. So you have to understand something. We have to be like the people in the book of Acts in the city of Berea. The Bible says Paul went to preach. And the scriptures tell us that while he was preaching, the people in Berea, they began to search out the scriptures to see if what he was saying was in the book. They wanted to make sure... Paul's a great preacher. He's a good man. But you know what? I've got to compare Scripture with Scripture. What is he saying? Does this line up with the Old Testament? How does this fit into the New Testament? Vice versa. And, they, and the Bible says they were more noble than the Thessalonians. I want you to be noble this morning in that biblical sense. That you don't just take everything a preacher says, hook, line, and stinker. Come on. You don't just take it all. Just because he's a prophet and he's an apostle and he's on TV and he's whatever. But you search the scriptures. You contend earnestly for the faith, the body of truth. But then there's the other side of the coin. That's your personal faith. That's you believing in the word of God. Believing in the word. Your faith. I've kept the faith. I still believe. As a pastor, I want to lead you in three days of prayer and fasting because I still believe in the power of prayer and in the power of fasting. Amen? Amen. I still believe that if we pray, God will answer. And sometimes the answers linger long, and that means we just have to persevere in prayer. And if the answers don't come in our way or in our time, we have to trust in a sovereign God, in a faithful God. Contend earnestly. Paul said, I kept the faith. You know, a compliment that I've received from friends over the years is something that, that, that I really appreciate and I, I, I feel honored when they say this. People that have known me for all these years that may be uh, friends, they come to the church from time to time and, and they come and they hear me preach and they tell me this. They say, Pastor, you still, you haven't changed your message. You're still preaching the word. I'm sorry, I don't know what else to preach. <laughs> Read his digest, uh, TV guide, I mean. You're still preaching the word, thank God. Thank God, I want to be true to the word. See, there's no other message. Paul went to Corinth, he says, he says, when I came to you, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. You know, you, know what, you know what Jesus was saying? He wasn't saying, sing that song. Lift Jesus higher, lift Jesus higher. He wasn't saying that. You know what he meant? He said, if I be lifted up on the cross, if I be crucified, I will draw all men unto me. See, we preach Christ and him crucified because that's the only answer for the world. That's the only way you can find forgiveness, the only way you can find freedom, the only way you can get peace with God, because only through the cross and the shed blood of Jesus, I like what Billy Graham said, that famous evangelist, who said that the cross has a special spiritual magnetism. When you preach Christ and Him crucified, you don't have to embellish it with fancy words. You just preach it as it is, and it'll draw people. 
It'll draw people. Why? Because it is the wisdom of God and it is the power of God. Jesus died on the cross. He was buried. And on the third day, he rose again, triumphant over death, hell, and the grave. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. I fought a good fight. I finished my race. I kept the faith. The next verse says one word. Finally, finally, for a young man whom I had the privilege of being his pastor and marrying him and his wife, dedicating two of his children, praying within the last few weeks while he was battling with cancer, I was able to say at his funeral, this is Sammy's finally, finally, there is laid up for me, if you can put that next verse on, finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the righteous God will give, which the Lord will give to me, but not only to me, but to all who love his appearing. You see, for Paul, he was about to be executed. That was his finally. For a, a young man at 38 years old, that was his finally. All of us have a finally coming. We don't know when it is, but you have a finally. Some of you, it might be 50 years. Some of you, 60 years. I wish you all had 50. Well, some of you might not look so good in 50 years, but, <laughs> but the reality is we don't know when our finally is. But I want you all to be able to say on that day, hallelujah. hallelujah. That's all that's going to matter. Last week, the whole world was fixated on a fight between Mayweather and McGregor. The winner gets 200 million, the loser only ends up with 75 million. Give me the handkerchiefs. Poor guy, only made 75 million. There was all hype, there was all sensationalism, there was a lot of rhetoric. But that's small potatoes compared to what Paul said. I fought a good fight. That's what matters. That's not hype, that's not sensationalism, that's not rhetoric. That's the truth of God's word. The greatest thing you could say at the end of it all, I fought a good fight. Doesn't matter what occupation you have. Doesn't matter what you do in this life, business-wise and, and career-wise. You want to be able to say, I fought a good fight. I finished my race. I kept the faith. And finally, would you stand together with me? Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. My God. 200 million can't even compare with the crown of righteousness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody ought to look a little more happy that your finally is going to be a crown of righteousness, which the righteous judge, the Lord, will give not only to me, Paul said, but to all who love. Do you love his appearing? Come on, are you looking for the coming of Jesus? Oh, come on, turn to the person next to you and let them know you're happy that there's going to be a finally. Come on, come on, give them a great big smile. Amen. Holly, give the Lord a clap this morning. Come on, give the Lord a praise. I want you to lift your hands to heaven. I want you to repeat after me. Say, I'm going to fight a good fight. I'm going to finish the race. I'm going to keep the faith. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, God bless you. God bless you. Go in the grace of God. Amen. my heart.